welcome uh, to our presentation in the lecture series Speech Acts in Grammar and Discourse. Uh, this morning or this afternoon or this night, wherever you are, uh, Patrick Gross from the University of Oslo will give a presentation from Norway. So Patrick received his first linguistic uh, education at the University of Vienna in his native Austria and his PhD in 2011 at MIT with a very uh, influential work on ARIA Speech Act, the optative, and this makes him a very good uh, candidate for this series. Uh, he was then employed at the University of Tübingen in Germany till 2016, where he received his habitation, and then he went north to Oslo. So Patrick is, I think, equally at home in syntax, semantics, and pragmatics, and I think one cannot be at home in semantics, at least, without being comfortable, at least, in syntax and pragmatics as well, and he's, he's an ideal example of that. Uh, he's worked on optative clauses and related speech acts like imperatives on modal concord, on German discourse particles, on conditionals, on phenomenal reference, and on other phenomena. And I think his current paper will reflect influences of the work on superlinguistics that is coming out, especially from Oslo, which looks at human communication beyond language in a narrow sense. He will talk about speech acts, interjections, and emojis revisiting communicative cues. And this commentator will be Jeremy Kuhn of the CNRS at the uh, Institut Nicot in Paris, which is part of the Ecole Normale Supérieure. Uh, Jeremy's focus is also on semantics, but with a particular focus on sign language. Uh, for example, he's worked on the plural dependencies and in general on iconic properties of language um, and on similarities and differences between the signed and spoken varieties of human language. Uh, Jeremy has received his PhD at NYU in 2015. And before we start, I should say that this talk and the commentary will be recorded. Uh, we will make it available like the other talks on the um, SAS website. Um, I should mention that this is an activity of the ERC project Spagat, Speech Acts in Grammar and Discourse. But now let's listen to Patrick's talk about emoticons and what Jeremy has to say about it. And you can start. All right, thank you so much for the uh, kind invitation to present at the Spagat lecture series and for the lovely introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here and I'm very excited to um, present my work, uh, ongoing work on emojis to all of you. I'm really looking forward to the um, to the discussion and uh, Jeremy's commentary in particular. Uh, I think this is going to be a really interesting and um, a productive uh, conversation. So let me just uh, jump right in by tell, to tell you what this talk will be about. Just to double check, uh, I hope you can all hear me well and you should be seeing my second slide now. Uh, so uh, I will start by introducing the topic of uh, face emojis. And uh, in line with the overall theme of Spagat, I'm going to then zoom in on a puzzle, which are the illocutionary uses of face emojis. And uh, I will then uh, present or revisit a proposal that goes back to my work on optatives, uh, which treats expressive items or items that uh, communicate non-net issue meaning as uh, pragmatic cues. Uh, for, for example, speech acts or elocutionary force. And um, I will propose that the same approach can actually be carried over to emojis. And then the first step uh, and uh, um, one of the central points of my talk will be to argue that emojis are actually a class of expressives. They are kind of elements or face emojis, like let me limit this to face emojis. They are um, carriers of expressive uh, non at issue meaning. And I will then uh, provide first steps towards an explanation of the locutionary effects of those face emojis based on um, the semantics of face emojis that I have been uh, working on with my uh, co-authors, collaborators, um, Elsie Kaiser, Gabe Greenberg, Christian De Leon, uh, Francesco Pierini, 
uh, Tatiana Scheffler. So uh, this is um, where we're heading. Now, uh, how to introduce face emojis? Well, facial expressions are a central component of human face-to-face -face communication. Right now, I see the video of uh, four of you. You see me on Zoom. And uh, we all have facial expressions, and facial expressions communicate different things, among which are emotive meanings. So here we have an example of uh, 12 different facial expressions. We can probably uh, see different emotions, emotive meanings in all of them. And from that, it is only a minor step to face emojis, which essentially are nothing other than, or one could argue, one could argue are nothing other than stylized facial expressions. I will actually propose that they are maybe slightly different from uh, stylized facial expressions, but that would be kind of the first step to say, well, face emojis are essentially the digital written counterparts of facial expressions. And uh, since they were introduced to an international market, which only happened about 11 years ago. So, I mean, fa face emojis have been around since the 1990s or emojis in general, but they were only really opened up to the international market through smartphones and similar devices in uh, 2011. But since then, they've, uh, they've basically become a central component of digital communication, especially written digital communication. And the role that they seem to fulfill there is essentially to bring facial expressions back into the written medium. Now, uh, Another take at facial at face emojis, and this is where it leads us away from facial expressions, is that they also seem to be very similar to interjections. So here is an example from 1990. Uh, this is um, uh, a naturally occurring example from a task where children were uh, were task solving. They were solving problems and uh, their conversation was sort of uh, recorded. And in, in one case, one of the children said, yay, only two more to go. And if you think about how you would write only, yay, only two more to go in 2022 on, on a smartphone, it is quite likely that you would write something like in two, only two more to go. Uh, and then this like um, beaming face emoji or, um, happy this happy face emoji here and in fact if you depending on what smartphone you have if you enter the word yay in a particular messaging software your phone might actually suggest why don't you replace it with an emoji like that so there's some intuitive overlap between the use of face emojis and the use of expressive interjections like yay um, here's a graph a, a chart from uh, seminal work by sarah yeager et al who were amongst the first to check whether face emojis map onto the valence arousal model, like the circumplex um, uh, valence arousal model. And uh, based on a survey of uh, more than 1,000 people, they sort of classified a set of uh, face emojis here. And you have the, the positively valenced ones on the right, the negatively valenced ones on the left, the, the excited ones on the top, and the, the calm ones on the bottom. And I mean, one, one interesting thing we can do is to try to see whether there are uh, interjections that um, map to each of those emojis, right? Like yay would map to those two, mm, maybe to this one, oh no, to these two, ugh, to these two. Now this is uh, in a sense, uh, somewhat of a futile exercise because um, as I'll say later in this talk, interjections are not true counterparts of face emojis, but at the same time, as a, as a point of departure, it's a very interesting analogy to draw because it actually teaches us something about how we can approach those face emojis. Um, so that brings me to this uh, overarching working hypothesis that today's talk is uh, couched uh, in, that is based on, which is that the properties of face emojis intersect on the one hand with the properties of facial expressions and that's a, a very um, very interesting aspect of face emojis that we can uh, look at but on the other hand they also um, intersect with the properties of interjections and this is actually the part that i'll be mostly focusing on uh, today but one thing that um, 
uh, is relevant when looking at the intersection between face emoji properties and facial expression properties is that facial expressions have also been argued to connect to intonation. Um, this is something that's been well established for uh, 30 years or maybe more than 30 years for sign languages. But uh, there's also work on uh, how facial expressions and intonation interact in, um, in non-signed languages as well. So um, this in itself is, of course, relevant because intonation is something that very heavily factors into the marking of speech acts. So if intonation can mark speech acts and facial expressions by, uh, by transitivity, um, uh, can mark speech acts. We expect face emojis to mark speech acts as well. And that is uh, one of the, the central parts of what I'll be focusing on today. A couple of remarks on the empirical method here. We start, so when I say we, I mean myself and uh, my collaborators, my collaborators and me. Uh, we start by uh, construct using both constructed examples and naturally occurring examples, for example, from Twitter, to establish intuitions. And we then uh, capture those intuitions by uh, initial hypotheses. And in the second step, uh, we uh, continue by testing the hypothesis experimentally. And um, our first two experiments, the ones uh, cited here, already confirm the validity of constructed examples and introspective intuitions. So emoji users, uh, by which I mean emoji users of all ages, it doesn't seem to be restricted to people who are emoji natives, whatever that means, like people born after 1996 who were like 15 or younger when emojis were introduced to an international, in, to an international market. Like all emoji users actually do have intuitions on emoji use, um, which is not surprising because uh, even though emojis are a human uh, artifact, that artifact is clearly shaped by human cognition and by how we relate to uh, things such as facial expressions. But uh, all emoji users have intuitions on, on emojis. And there are, of course, generational differences. I'm not going to go into those, but one of the things that uh, featured much in the media recently is that uh, Gen Z users, like people born after 1996, don't use the, the laughing face with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with tears anymore to mean laughing out loud, but they use the skull instead, which communicates, I laughed so much, I'm dead. Uh, so this is the kind of thing that uh, we won't be talking about today. Now, where do we find face emojis? And uh, here, these are naturally occurring examples from Twitter. We marked it by having this T in front of the number. They can be message initially, in which case they can be discourse initially or in response to a preceding message. They can be message final, uh, also message medial, that's uh, in, uh, in, in T3A and T3B. They can also surround the message as in T4. And there are other, re other readings, um, not other readings, other uses in addition to those uh, four uh, slash um, uh, six uses. Uh, but the important thing is that there's actually one that significantly uh, wins out over all the others in the sense that it's the most frequent one. So in a, in a whole range of empirical studies, it's been shown over and over again that more than 80% of all emoji uses are message final. So it's usually in the range of like 83, 86% uh, of all emoji uses. Other positions are less frequent. So today, most of the emoji uses we're looking at will also be cases where the emojis follow the text. Now, even before emojis were introduced to an international market in 2010, uh, Dresden and Herring already observed for emoticons like this colon and closing parentheses, uh, which have been around much longer than emojis, that they have locutionary uses. So one example, this one cited from Gone and McCullough is uh, I'm sick and tired all the time, smiling emoticon. Um, and here the smiling emoticon seems to communicate, and this is the description from Gone and McCullough, that the writer, the, the author is, is basically trying to soften a statement that might be perceived as a complaint. So you're kind of marking that your speech act here is not a complaint. It's kind of like, it's something else, not a complaint. 
it doesn't communicate that the writer or author is happy about being sick. That's not the point of that emoticon. Um, it really has some kind of like elocutionary use. For face emojis, uh, elocutionary uses have also been attested. Like if you have something as in four, come here, please. If you put an angry face after it or a heart eyed face after it, those have very different pragmatic effects on a conversation. Uh, similarly, one of the topics that people, most people who think of face emojis tend to think of irony and sarcasm very quickly. And uh, that um, feature of face emojis is demonstrated in 5B. Like if you have, I loved it, and you put this like happy face in 5A, then it communicates that you're being genuine. But if you have an eye roll face as in 5B, uh, not so genuine anymore. So these are the kind of uh, elocutionary effects that face emojis can have. And one thing, of course, uh, as, a, as a semanticist that uh, appeals to, to me, that appeals to us, is to start looking at it and picking at it more systematically. So specifically, when we look at imperatives, imperatives are well established to be highly unspecified or underspecified with regards to the speech act and certain imperatives more clearly go with one speech act than with another so here we have read this and that's typically a command or stay away from the projector that's a warning uh, other uses are wishes requests advice permission concessives like uh, all right don't come then if you think you're so clever there are also cases that are not even included here like imperatives can also be used uh, as curses right um, uh, this, this here is just a range that uh, Kaufman illustrates in, in her dissertation and monograph. But the interesting thing is what happens if we put face emojis into those. And one intuition uh, that uh, I would claim is very clear, but I'm very happy to hear your intuitions about those examples in the discussion period, is that if you take an imperative like call me, that is extremely underspecified, like it can be a command, it can be a warning, it can be a request, it can be a permission and invitation, it can also be concessive, like, okay, call me if you must. Um, if you put a face emoji after it, it always disambiguates towards, or, or not always, that's too strong, it often disambiguates towards one speech act, as opposed to the others. Now, if you have something like call me in an angry face, that is not a good request, I dare say. It's also not a good permission or a, a good invitation. Like it really can only communicate, uh, you must call me. Like it's like kind of a command, at least uh, if you have the message on its own. Whereas if you have like, call me with a sad face uh, and one, uh, one tear, I mean, that would not be a command. That would be more like a request. If you have a happy face emoji, it's more like a permission. And if you have an eye roll, it's more like concessive. And I, I invite you to think about your own intuitions about those, because I mean, these are this is the first set of intuitions. I'm very happy to discuss them. But I think the effects are clearly there. And uh, to a certain extent, we can agree on them. And then the question is, of course, uh, where do those effects come from? Like, how do they arise? And that brings me back to work uh, from my dissertation, which, uh, which Manfred kindly mentioned before, which is, uh, I was looking at optatives at the time, like optative sentences like, oh, if only he had at least come in time. And one thing that we notice about optatives is that they typically require some kind of marker. But the thing is any marker will do. So in 9e, the German uh, if clause, uh, wenn er rechtzeitig gekommen wäre, that is usually perceived to be not a very good optative. It's not a great optative. It's, it, it's kind of like, it seems like an incomplete conditional. But as soon as you put ach into it, ach wenn er rechtzeitig gekommen wäre, uh, then it sounds like an optative. Then it sounds like it's expressing a wish. And the same for doch, which is a discourse particle, nur, which I would argue in this case is a truth conditionally or a vacuous nur. It's like a discourse particle-ish use of nur. Wenigstens, which is a concessive at least use. All of these elements can license an optative, license used in an informal way. None of them is required per se. Like any of them will do, but if you don't have any of them, suddenly the sentence becomes un unacceptable. And if you look at English, 
we find something very similar with uh, verb first exclamatives like uh, 10D, did we love them or did we love them? Doesn't sound too great as, a, as an exclamative. As soon as you put some interjection in front of it, it's always fine. Like, boy, did we love them? Wow, did we love them? Oh, did we love them? It all means how very much we love them. One thing that Pesetsky and Torrego observe in a, in a really interesting footnote is that even a whistle or a sharp intake of breath can be enough. Something like, did we love them? It's kind of, but, but you need something. It can't be without any marking whatsoever. And uh, for optatives and, uh, and exclamatives, um, one way to look at it is that these different markers, which include interjections, are essentially their speech act cues. They're, they, they neither classify as a sufficient uh, or as a necessary condition for the speech act, so they don't actually encode the speech act, but they're typical for a given use of an utterance. So something like ach goes very well with wishes. That's why it can license uh, a, a, an optative interpretation of an if clause. Like if you put ach in front of an if clause or in English, oh, I think it's actually the same. Oh, if I had listened to my parents, something like that. I mean, that's like a classical example, right? Um, it's just this, the, the sigh that comes with the interjection seems to license the wish. Um, and that is what, what cues the speech, what cues in the speech act. So the speech act itself has to be available independently. And that's, that's a part of the machinery that I'm not going to be focusing too much on today. But the cues are what helps you get the right speech act in a given situation. And uh, the a pragmatic principle that I've proposed in this connection is that if an intended use of an ambiguous utterance has a low prior probability, and the, the, the content of the utterance itself, like the utterance context, doesn't independently mark the intended utterance use um, as, as uh, make it prominent, then cues become obligatory. So something like, did we love them? Unless you have indication that this is intended to be a, a, a verb first exclamative, you really need to have a cue in it to get the verb first exclamative reading. And uh, it's the same notion of speech act cues and the same notion of cue utilization that I'd like to propose for uh, face emojis. Now, of course, you might wonder, are face emojis ever obligatory? And I think uh, I'm going to say you be the judge of that. Like if you get a message out of the blue without previous uh, exchange where your friend Alex writes, call me without any face emoji. How natural is that? I mean, it's probably not ungrammatical. Of course not. It might not be entirely semantically or pragmatically deviant. But um, in many situations, it will seem slightly odd, I would say. And I mean, this is something I'd be happy to discuss in the discussion period. If anything, I think the reading that we get is one of urgency. Like if there's no face emoji or no other marker of something like an invitation, for instance, then it's clearly like uh, an urgent request or even a command, like you have to call me now. I think that's the reading that we will get if it doesn't have any emoji on it. Whereas if you have like a happy face, it's like an invitation, like I got something to tell you or something like that. Now, when we expand utilize cues to face emojis, I mean, one property of speech IQs cues is that they tend to be truth conditional vacuous. Like they tend to be things like presupposition triggers or use conditional uh, items in the sense of Gutzmann. Now I, I use truth conditional vacuous. I, I know this term sometimes uh, gets challenged. I use it to sort of um, mean uh, information that really contributes to the truth uh, conditions of the containing um, uh, utterance. So that, that contributes to the uh, proposition that uh, hosts the elements. Like, like, doch nur wenigstens, ach, they don't contribute to the proposition itself, but they just trigger presuppositions or uh, maybe expressive meaning, use conditional meaning at a different level. And um, for that to include face emojis, we, uh, I'm going to argue that face emojis can also be analyzed as expressives or as use conditional items of this type. So if you have a happy face, it would be something like here in 14, it's modeled as a presupposition trigger, but I'm not uh, wedded to that at all. So it kind of, it maps the proposition to itself uh, under the condition that the author is happy about the proposition. I'll, I'll sort of tweak that a little bit uh, later in today's presentation. 
but that would be kind of where we're going with this. Um, to see that that is plausible at all, uh, I'd like to zoom in on this intersection between face emojis and interjections and uh, argue that face emojis are actually expressive. They, they are carriers of expressive meanings or use conditional items. And um, how do we know that or how do we see that? Um, well, I mean, as, a, as, a, as formal semanticists, uh, we, we turn to POTS. I mean, that's one of the places we turn to, right? And the POTSian criteria from, uh, from uh, POTS 2005 and 2007. Um, so what I'm going to do in the next couple of slides is just illustrate and argue that face emojis actually do satisfy all six POTSian criteria. Uh, the first one is uh, independence. And independence, I have two diagnostics for independence here. The first one is that emoji content in this case cannot be directly de uh, denied. And by directly denied, just to be entirely clear about it, I mean you cannot say no in response to an emoji containing message and thereby deny the emoji content. The rest of these uh, answers here is just to clarify what is being denied. But if someone, if A texts you, Webster is sleeping happy face and you text back no, you can continue by texting he isn't, by which you, you deny the truth conditional content of the text. But it seems really deviant to text back no, you're not happy about it. I mean, you can of course deny it by writing, wait a minute, you're not happy about this or something like, uh, I, I don't believe you're in that. But you, it, it seems really deviant to write, no, you're not happy about it. So the emoji content cannot be trivially denied in a direct way by means of no. Uh, but also more, maybe more importantly, emoji content also doesn't affect the truth conditional content of the text that the emoji com uh, occurs with. So here we have a context where everybody knows that A is happy that it is sunny. And then A texts you, it is sunny frowny face emoji. Now, here the emoji content, the, the use conditions contributed by the emoji would be something like, I'm unhappy about it. And that is clearly false in this context, at least uh, assuming that there's no further information like A is in the basement and won't see the sun all day long or something like that. Um, so that is clearly false. The truth conditions are that, I mean, this is true if and only if it is sunny. And the intuition here is that the falseness of the emoji uh, use conditions of the emoji content doesn't affect the truth conditions of the text. I mean, the message, it is sunny frowny face is clearly true if it is sunny. It doesn't become false or undefined if we know that the author is unhappy about it, um, is, is happy about it. So I used the wrong adjective now. But if we know that the emoji content is false, that doesn't affect the text meaning at all. And that is independence in the sense that the emoji content is really like on a different level uh, from the truth conditional content of the text. Uh, two other criteria for uh, expressive meaning are that emoji content cannot be easily shifted in time. There, there's some counter examples, but Trivial, it's not trivially possible. And it also cannot be denied from applying to an utterance content context. So if you write something like, I overslept yesterday and raged face emoji, it seems really contradictory to afterwards follow up by writing, but I'm not upset about it now because I woke up on time today. I mean, that seems contradictory. You, you clearly, if you write something like that, you. you you, you didn't use the enraged face emoji correctly because um, by simply using it or employing, uh, deploying it, you're strongly communicating that you're upset about it now. So this is the non-displaceability. You cannot shift the emoji meaning into the past. Uh, similarly, the, um, the emoji content is immediate. So you cannot write, I overslept yesterday enraged face but I'm not expressing negative feelings towards oversleeping. That also seems contradictory because once you use the enraged face, 
you're expressing negative feelings. You can't just take it back afterwards and say, by the way, I, I feel fine about it, right? I, I mean, this is not something that's possible. So these are actually two, two criteria from POTS uh, grouped together because in, in some sense, they're very closely connected. I mean, they're about the immediate deployment of expressive meaning in a given context. Um, a third criteria, the fourth criteria in, in that vein is perspective dependence. Uh, so the content of uh, expressive emojis is typically interpreted from the author's perspective. And that is something that uh, very early on, Amaral et al. 2007 observed that it's not entirely right, like expressive meaning can shift, but it's highly limited to what extent it can shift. Uh, these examples here are taken from experimental stimuli of uh, Kaiser and Gross uh, 2021. If you have something like Abigail brought dessert to Emily, um, uh, drooling face emoji, that's what it's called, uh, the, pers the, the attitude holder of the positive like evaluation, like the, the, the tastiness evaluation of the dessert is quite uncontroversially the author. Like people infer that the person who, 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 who is happy in their thoughts about the dessert and who, who drools at thinking of it, it's the author and it's not Emily or Abigail. And this is the reading that we get for most face emojis. It's only if we have a psych predicate that matches the emoji in, um, in valence, uh, then uh, the, the emoji meaning can to a limited extent uh, shift towards having the experience as the attitude holder. So if you have something like Richie annoyed Adrian, um, annoyed face, people will uh, say that Adrian is the, the attitude holder. And if you have Daniel admires Adrian, Aaron with a happy face, then uh, Daniel is the attitude holder. So once again, uh, so far, face emojis have fulfilled all of the pots and criteria for expressive meaning. Uh, two more are slightly more controversial, like repeatability and descriptive ineffability are sometimes questioned as um, uh, criteria for expressive meaning. But to the extent that they count as diagnostics for expressive meanings, face emojis actually satisfy them par excellence. So face emojis are repeatable elements uh, par excellence. You can, if you have something like, what did they do? Enraged, enraged, enraged. That is like how people use face emojis. Like if you have two, two emojis in a sequence, more often than not, it's two face emojis. And more often than not, it's the identical two face emojis. That's something that Gon and McCullough observe. We also get interesting cases like T21. I keep accidentally reacting to people's Instagram stories. They might think I disgusted face, like disgusted face, them disgusted face. So here, again, you have a repetition. And just with POTS's expressives, the repetition sort of, in some sense, strengthens the expression, the expressiveness of the, um, the emotive content. Uh, here, it also seems to have some additional uh, scope marking property. But in any case, the bottom line is that face emojis are repeatable. And moving on to the last uh, criterion from POTS, they are also extremely ineffable. So POTS himself observes that speakers are never fully satisfied when they paraphrase expressive content by means of descriptive meaning, uh, descriptive terms. But with face emojis, even expressive words don't show complete equivalence. So we've already established that uh, a, a grinning face seems to map onto the interjection yay, but there's no full equivalence here. So it's quite natural to write something like, did you miss me grinning face? Or what did you buy a grinning face? But it's entirely unnatural to put a, an interjection in those cases. So did you miss me? Yay. Yay, did you miss me? What did you buy? Yay. Yay, what did you buy? I mean, all of these sound entirely deviant. So here too, Face emojis are, in a sense, even more ineffable than other expressives because they cannot even, they aren't even affable by virtue of expressive words. So the, the, it's not like we can't use descriptive terms to capture the face emoji impact, but we can't even use expressive words to capture the impact of face emojis. So having argued that face emojis are expressive elements, we can now turn to what kind of meaning they actually encode. 
Um, here is uh, a version that uh, I've already sketched before, this time not modeled as a presupposition, but just as um, uh, a function to a set of worlds. We do assume that this is non at issue meaning, but we're not uh, extremely committed to what kind of non at issue meaning it is. But so if you if someone writes, you must be starving and you write back, I've already eaten happy face. Well, we might think uh, there is a target proposition uh, P, which is I've already eaten. Uh, the speaker or author is happy about P and that's pretty much just the end of the story. But uh, that's not quite how face emojis work. There is um, the information state in the conversation matters. So here, if your friend writes, you must be starving and you write back, I've already eaten happy face. And then they write, I just made chili tofu. It's entirely natural to write, oh, I've already eaten sad face. And the only thing that changed is the information that is available to you. So to account for that uh, sensitivity to contextual factors, slightly simplified here, what we propose is that face emojis don't just evaluate a target proposition P, which here would also be the author has already eaten, but they evaluate how that proposition P bears on some contextual salient value, like a goal, something that the author desires, aspires to. And in this case, that is that the author eats chili tofu. And if the author has already eaten, it entails that the author is not eating chili tofu. And that is how, what makes the author unhappy in this situation. Now, you might at this point say, uh, hey, wait a minute, uh, are we just assuming that face emojis comment on the text that they occur with? Uh, can we take that for granted? And uh, we're not just assuming that. We have uh, arguments for, um, for such a view, which is basically, there's two points. The first point is on this slide, which is that emoji text combinations exhibit ordering effects. Like if you have something like, I'm really hungry, which is a negative statement, and then you have just ordered some food, which is a positive statement, um, a face emoji always seems to target the proposition that immediately precedes it. So it seems entirely natural to write, I'm really hungry, sad face, just ordered some food. But it seems really deviant to slightly change it and have, I'm really hungry, just ordered some food, sad face. Now, if the sad face emoji just were to contribute some general state of unhappiness, that state shouldn't change while you're writing a message. Like it's not like when you start writing the message, you're unhappy. And when you finish writing the message, you're happy. I mean, that state should be the, the, the same throughout the message, but that's not how emojis behave. Like emojis really seem to latch on the proposition that immediately precedes them and comment on that. So if you have, I'm really hungry, sad face, that's fine. But if you have just ordered some food, sad face, that's a bit puzzling. And we see that if we take that same message in 27B, and change the unhappy face to a happy face in 28A, uh, um, that seems fine, no? I'm really hungry, just ordered some food, happy face. But if you flip, just ordered some food, I'm really hungry, which by itself is acceptable, then the happy face suddenly becomes deviant. Like, why would you put the happy face at the end of that message? And this wouldn't be predicted if emojis just communicated general happiness or unhappiness. So this for us is a strong, reason to uh, to to um, conclude that face emojis do comment on a proposition provided in the in the text in the in the preceding context um, even more intriguingly face emojis uh, are sensitive to, to the framing of a preceding utterance so here if we're watching college football there's no ties not winning equals losing we know that our current chances are 50-50. We didn't have pre uh, previous expectations, like we didn't expect our chances to be better than that. Now it seems perfectly fine to write, there's a 50% chance we'll win happy face. Um, whereas it seems, uh, that's in 29A, whereas it seems kind of deviant in 29G uh, to, to write, there's a 50% chance we'll lose happy face even though there's a 50% chance we'll win and there's a 50% chance we'll lose, describe exactly the same situation. The only thing that's different is the framing. But the face emoji seems to be sensitive to that framing. Uh, 
more intricately if we add only the intuitions flip so if we change from 29a to 29b there's only a 50 percent chance we'll win it becomes deviant if we change from 29g there's a 50 percent chance we'll lose to 29h uh, there's only a 50% chance we'll lose happy face. It actually becomes uh, well-formed. So adding only flips um, the, 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 the acceptability of a happy uh, face emoji. And what 29C, D, E, and F show is that it's exactly the same, just mirrored with the unhappy face emoji. So emojis are clearly sensitive to the linguistic material of the text that precedes them or that accompanies them. And we're not arguing that the emojis are sensitive to the lexical meaning of win or lose, but rather they're, they're, they're sensitive to the framing of uh, how the, the, the situation is described. Now, to summarize what we know here, uh, we've proposed that face emojis comment on a proposition P, and um, I, I'll elaborate on this part in a moment, uh, what, what we're assuming in, in the paper that uh, I've just been reporting on is that they, they access P through an anaphoric relation. They don't, they don't, it's not like the emojis are in the syntax. The, it's not like they compositionally combine with the proposition that they comment on, but, but they retrieve it from the uh, preceding text in, in our cases. And then uh, they evaluate P in light of a contextual given value. Like does P demote my value? So having already eaten, demotes eating chili tofu, that's what makes me unhappy. So that's why 30A is good. Or does it promote my value? Like having already eaten promotes having already eaten, that makes me happy. Uh, so that's how 31A uh, is fine. So the values they're uh, contextually given or determined or sometimes even signaled by the emojis. Now, one thing that becomes important when we start looking at imperatives and speech acts is that face emojis can comment on propositions other than what is asserted. Uh, a first example is in 32. Like if you text, who drank my coffee, sad face emoji or upset face emoji, you're communicating that you're upset that someone drank your coffee. I mean, and that is uh, the face emoji here seems to comment on the presupposition of the WH question. You're not commenting on the expected answer or something else, or just um, you're just really commenting on the presupposition in 32. But other examples are such that face emojis do target expected answers. Like these examples, um, uh, probably very familiar here, isn't there some vegetarian restaurant around here? If you want there to be a, a vegetarian restaurant around here, a happy face emoji is perfectly acceptable after this uh, question. Similarly, is there no vegetarian restaurant around here? Again, if you want there to be a, 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 a vegetarian restaurant, a sad face is completely acceptable. So in both cases, the face emoji seems to target the expected answer. Like there is a vegetarian restaurant or there is no vegetarian restaurant. So once again, the face emojis are commenting on something other than just the proposition expressed by the preceding text. And now we can come back to imperatives. And uh, how, so the question is how would emojis cue a certain speech act? And um, a first step can be to look at uh, the Emojipedia descriptions. Emojipedia, for those of you who don't know, is uh, it's basically, as I understand it, a, a one-man project. It's like um, uh, a website where emoji meanings are uh, documented and uh, based on, um, on, on, on what is observed in the internet, based on discussions on the internet. And it's a very valuable resource for anyone working on emojis, even though it's not an uh, academic scientific research in, the, in that sense. So what does Emojipedia say about the angry face? Conveys varying degrees of anger from grumpiness and irritation to disgust and outrage. What does Emojipedia say about the sa sad face? A moderate degree of sadness or pain uh, for this slightly happy one. It's like a wide range of warm, positive feelings. For the iral one, uh, moderate disdain, disapproval, frustration, or boredom. So how would these meanings uh, get to you a particular speech act. And for that, it becomes informative uh, to look at what the emojis actually comment on. Like with call me angry face, there are at least 
two readings, and this is intuitive and preformal. Um, there are at least two targets for the emoji. It can mean that the speaker or author is angry at the addressee. That's a plausible reading. I'll come back to where these readings come from in the next slide. It could also be that the author is angry at the cause for uh, why the author wants the addressee to call the author. So it's kind of like, I might write this not because I'm angry at you, but because I'm angry of something that happened. And this is why I want you to call me. I mean, this is a use that is available, maybe less with the angry face than with some of the others, but it's definitely there. And uh, the author could also communicate that they're angry at the non-realizations uh, of the addressee calling the author. So if you, if you haven't been called yet, uh, then you're angry that you haven't been called yet. Uh, so how would a cue-based explanation work? Well, the angry face here can act as a cue for a command or warning, not by encoding a command or warning, but by basically eliminating all of the other readings that are most uh, uh, saliently competing. Like you wouldn't write this as a request. This is not how you how you how you text a request, and you also wouldn't write it as an invitation. Like if you want to invite people to call you don't put an angry face at the end. So in, at some stage, cue-based uh, marking of speech acts is, uh, as, can be as minimal as that. Like the, the connection between the face emoji and the speech act that we get can be as indirect as that. Um, where do the three possible targets come from? Well, I think addressee-oriented readings are generally available for emojis. Like most emojis can be used in a way where the facial expression does target the ad addressee. Like a happy face can also mean I feel nice towards you. An angry face can also mean I feel angry about you. Um, that one comes for free in a way. Um, for 38D in this case, this, the author is angry at the non-realization of the prompted action. That uh, is a, a plausible condition for a non-trivial use of a directive. I mean, it goes back all the way to Searle's preparatory conditions for requests. Like it is not obvious uh, to both the speaker and the hearer that the hero will do the action in the normal course of events of his own uh, course. I mean, it's kind of like, if it's not obvious that you'll call me, um, I mean, that is uh, what the angry face is targeting in 38D, this kind of the non-realization of the calling, the non-obviousness that it's going to happen, or it definitely hasn't happened yet. Uh, 38C may require further inferencing. So that is uh, the case where you're actually targeting the cause for the directive. And it's plausible because wishes and desires are often motivated by superordinate goals. Um, but it might take some working out uh, to see just exactly how that chain of goals work in this case. Now I'm almost finished. I think I'm pretty much in time. Uh, uh, so the one, one thing we observe is that we can spin the same story for all face emojis. I mean, a happy face can communicate that I feel positively towards you, but it can also feel communicate that I feel positively about the cause for why I want you to call me. So, I mean, if I write, call me happy face, it can mean, well, there's good news. I want to tell you good news. And that's why, I mean, that is why I want you to call me. Um, with the happy face, it seems a bit unlikely that it targets the non-realization. I'm not happy that you haven't called me yet. That's not a, a possible reading. With the sad face, uh, in many cases, uh, the, the intuition here would be that call me on a sad face doesn't mean I'm sad for you. It's more like I'm sad for either the fact that you haven't called me yet in 40D, or I'm sad and I'm sad about the cause for why I want you to call me. That's 40C. And um, the eye roll, I mean, that is kind of like you could either disprove of the addressee and then you call me. Okay, go ahead. Uh, or of the, the cause for, um, maybe you're disapproving of the cause for why you want the addressee to call you. Possibly you wouldn't disapprove of the fact that the addressee isn't calling you because you'd be happy if they don't. So um, this is how it would work for the other emojis. And on that note, I'm uh, going to conclude and, uh, and let, uh, let Jeremy um, uh, present his commentary. So what, what, what do we know? about illocutionary functions of face emojis. Well, they can disambiguate uh, speech acts, and I've illustrated that for imperatives. Uh, they share this property 
of disambiguating speech acts with natural language expressions such as interjections, uh, which uh, by themselves communicate some kind of like use conditional non at issue meaning. Um, face emojis can be argued to be of the same nature, at least at some level of semantic processing in that they contribute an expressive meaning and their interactions with speech acts can thus be explained by modeling them as speech acts. Now, one big open question is, well, facial expressions can directly encode speech acts. Is there potential for face emojis to simply encode assertion or a question? And that's actually quite striking. I'm just gonna say that very briefly because it's been observed in the literature that face emojis very often replace punctuation. Um, face emojis in a sense are the punctuation of digital written communication. Like people use face emojis instead of full stops, instead of question marks. And full stops and question marks are how we traditionally mark, well, sentence types like form types, but also speech acts and illocutionary force in written text. But are there face emojis for assertion or a question? Um, I don't know. I don't think there are but uh, I'm curious to hear what you all have to say. And on that note, I would like to thank you, the audience. And I'd also like to thank my collaborators on work on emojis. Uh, uh, the work that I presented today um, has grown out of the work that I've been carrying out with these collaborators. So um, thank you uh, uh, very much. And on that note, I conclude my talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Patrick. This was a very interesting uh, and concise presentation that I did too. And uh, we turn over to Jeremy now. Um, so uh, there, I, I guess as Patrick was talking, I had yet more questions that arose in my uh, head. So I'll leave that to the audience afterwards to ask those questions. But I guess I want to focus on some other connections. Possibly there's this Venn diagram with various intersecting things, possibly mining some of the connections between actual facial expressions with the face as opposed to textual ones. Um, so um, you, Patrick, you talked at some length about this idea of uh, face emoji as expressives and many of the examples that you gave for uh, English interjections, but of course you also had some examples with these German discourse particles, which I know are near and dear to your heart as well. Um, and so one one sort of reference that I thought might be uh, one connection to, to build in there is is this work by Annika Herman. I think you also know this work. Um, the, the book is uh, Modal and Focus Particles in Sign Languages. Let's uh, ignore the focus particles because I think it's a little bit less relevant. Um, but essentially the, the question in this book is how do you communicate basically the things that German discourse particles communicate, how do you communicate those in sign language? And she looks at these three sign languages, German sign language, sign language of the Netherlands, and Irish sign language, which are sort of different language families as well. Um, and there's sort of a funny conclusion uh, in terms of discussing discourse particles in that the answer is for ironic, given that the title is modal particles in sign languages, the answer is that there are none. And rather, the ways that these kinds of meanings are communicated is through non-manual markers, through facial expressions. Um, though one thing that I think is interesting, sort of another interesting finding of the book is that even though like Irish sign language and German sign language have no real connection, you have similar non-manual signs that are re recurring. And I think you've seen similar things in, in Israeli sign language. So for example, this I squint for shared knowledge, which you wouldn't necessarily, I mean, I guess actually when you think about it, maybe you, we non-signers, uh, I guess non-signers may actually have intuitions about uh, eye squint. Um, but so I guess um, it, that, that sort of suggests something a little bit more innate about some of these, 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 these meanings, which I think is a theme that I want to sort of highlight and ask you about, uh, which is where do these primitive building blocks come from? Are they linguistic? Are they non-linguistic? Might there be variation of the way that non-linguistic components are expressed? Um, something that uh, I I think is also another thing that's sort of interesting about this uh, work, though, um, is something I, I guess I, I have a review of this of this book where I talk about this in a little bit more length. But this possible hypothesis, which is maybe, is there a linguistic pressure to employ multi-dimensional form? to express multidimensional meaning. 
right? So the idea is if you have expressives, what is that? That's, I mean, if you take a pot style analysis, you've got two components of meaning and they don't really interact. And, um, and so from a level of the language, might this actually have an impact on the syntax as well, on the sort of phonology even of, of these kinds of uh, forms? And, and so even, you know, discourse particles, right, like doch and all these things that I don't actually know what they mean, um, even when they're grammaticalized, you might actually expect that constructions with multi-dimensional non-interactive semantics might actually also be more likely to have a non-interactive syntax with fewer pressures on linearization. And that seems, not that I've done much work on particles, but that seems like a pretty good first pass characterization of what particles are from a syntax, morphosyntactic perspective. And so I, I guess this is like I, a more general question is like, do we see these kinds of pressures sort of pre-linguistic pressures on the ling on sort of the form of a language as a whole. Um, so you mentioned uh, this work of mine uh, on speech acts. So I want to talk a little bit more about this. So uh, you mentioned this quote from your presentation. One area where face emotions seem to have clear elocutionary effect is in connections with imperatives. Um, I don't know whether you know the, the work by uh, Diane Brentarian colleagues. Um, so essentially what, what she did in this was to look at how signers of American Sign Language, what they do with their face when signing imperatives in a variety of different ways. So she, the four varieties of imperatives that they looked at were command, explanation, permission, and advice. There are examples in the paper for the kinds of situations that are being described. And then this was tested first, a production task, then a second comprehension task for signers of the ASL, and then three other sort of control groups, one which is American non-signers, signers of DGS, German Sign Language, and then German non-signers. Um, and there's this sort of general finding, which is that all the subject groups can deduce this imperative type from the actual facial expression, um, with a little bit of a boost for ASL signers, suggesting that there might actually be something linguistic going on there as well. Um, but so one question that I I do have uh, that I would be interested if you have a take on, and I'm not really clear if there's a deep commitment that you have. Is there something special about imperatives? It, like, would you do you think that there's more elocutionary acts that are related to imperatives compared to, say, indicatives or questions? Um, I mean, if you do, I would be wondering why that is. Or another possibility is that this sort of the fact that people have studied these for imperatives is kind of a quirk of the literature based on some earlier descriptions and say, oh, that's easy to test. Um, and one sort of side fact or side question that I have is um, whether you do see linguistic sort of grammatical markers that actually encode these uh, uh, flavors of imperatives um, compared to, say, for example, you know, WH questions or yes no questions where you have very clear syntactic kind of particles or, or other things going on. And so this is a little bit of motivation for the, the paper that you act, that you mentioned. Um, it was inspired by the Brentari et al. paper. And so we basically wanted to do exactly the same thing that um, that Brentari and colleague did, but for these very large coarse grained uh, speech uh, speech act um, speech acts. So notably the, in sign language, it has been documented that facial expressions have these grammatical functions, and these really seem to be sort of on the same order of explanation as sort of in verb inversion in, in English. So, you know, you've got things that mark negation and can be the sole marker of negations. And then in, in uh, many sign languages, raising your brows marks yes, no questions, or maybe questions more generally. And specifically in ASL, this is a bit more, uh, there's a bit more variation on this one, brow furrow, signals uh, WH questions. And so what we were interested in doing was basically uh, asking whether you can use this, for, uh, whether you can indicate kind of, or sorry, whether facial expressions can indicate the kind of speech acts in spoken language too. Um, I wanted to sort of highlight that here I use the word indicate um, in part because I actually maybe would like to be agnostic about whether we would say that these actually are encoding this or cueing this. I think probably in sign language, uh, I would want to say these encode this, that these are sort of markers that have a particular grammatic, you know, f grammatical function. Um, but I'm going to get back to this in, in a second. So let me just sort of give you some intuitions. I got to share my audio, I think.
Oh no, actually these are, uh, the audio will come in a bit in a second, but this will be useful. Share computer sound. Um, so, but what we did was we just basically took gestures, silent gestures that sort of have meaning. And so the question is, uh, four videos, four meanings, um, you have to associate each with each. Right. Here's the second one. Here's the third one. And the last one. So you might have already sort of, um, I've told you the hypothesis because I mentioned what the answers are for ASL, but we didn't do that to our um, M Turkers. Uh, and so what we did find, we did a variety of different variations, one where we showed the full video, one which we cropped my face, one where we cropped my face, but then mixed it up so the meanings were from the other videos, and one which was just a still image of my face, and lots of M Turkers seeing my face online. And I guess the sort of the, the point is that across the board they did better than chance, where 25% would be chance. Um, there's not a lot of difference actually between, they actually do a little bit better on the imperative, but when you get rid of the, the uh, hands, maybe just because it's a little bit weird to think about these imperative gestures with the imperative meanings with the gestures themselves. And then maybe the noticeable, most notable thing for the, um, uh, for experiment forwards, a still image is that the indicative goes down. This might actually be a little bit related to your question about marking, uh, uh, um, indicative or questions. Um, and I think the biggest thing there is that I had a, a head nod that you may have noticed in this sort of indicative, it's going to take some time. And with a still image, you cut out that particular, I'll say the word Q. Um, uh, and then I think that probably is responsible for why this green bar drops there. Um, so, but relating to this question of sort of cues versus um, markers, uh, one question that is not in this, I made this video specifically for this presentation. Um, I wonder, like, I was wondering what happens if you actually mismatch? So let's say that the prosody and the syntax in English is sort of um, encoding speech act. And so here I'm basically going to say in the, the same sentence, I'm going to say, who's going to the party? Then either Hugh's going to the party, going up to the, or Hugh's going to the party, uh, falling intonation. But then I'm going to have the different facial expressions. It's exactly the same audio, but I did some editing to sort of match it up differently. And uh, I want you to sort of get your intuitions to see if you um, what you think about this. Who is coming to the party? Can you hear that, Who's by the way? The party? Hugh is coming to the party. Hugh is coming to the party. Hugh is coming to the party. Who is coming to the party? Hugh is coming to the party. Who is coming to the party? Hugh's coming to the party? So it, uh, it's, I, it's quite quick when you see them all one after the other. But I think one thing that is notable to me, you know, as an English speaker viewing my own face, um, is that actually some of them are not bad. So it doesn't, it does not look like these are ungrammatical. And often you get these sort of further, like, quote, layers of meaning. For example, if I say, Hugh's coming to the party, question mark, and I'm shaking and nodding my head, there is pr probably um, this, I am I'm confirming something like, oh, I think he probably is, and won't that be good? Um, for the raised eyebrows for WH questions, who's coming to the party? Um, it's very subtle if there's a difference in meaning. I think that the two question uh, ones can be very easily exchanged. And then uh, it's something like, uh, who's coming to the party? But if I raise my eyebrows, I'm surprised or concerned or something like that. So so I think that this is actually pretty, um, you know, I, there's the, the, the quote, again, a couple of different quotes from your presentation. Um, so in that that paper, or the, the poster that, that you mentioned, um, so certainly in sign language, I think you do have an encoding of speech acts. Probably what I would say at the moment is that this is something like in, um, a cue for, in the same way that you have a cue for opt op optativity, this probably would be more of a cue that is sort of filtering out some of the, the meanings. Um, another thing, I guess this final quote, this face emojis can comment on propositions other than what is being asserted. I think that's also something that you see kind of here where it can be, I'm nodding not necessarily because of the question, but because of the associated proposi the proposition that's associated with the question, like, will it be good? 
um, he's coming to the party. How are we doing on time? Can I talk a, a little bit more or? That's fine, five more minutes or so. Yeah, okay, so we'll talk a little bit more. Yes, yes. Um, so uh, you mentioned irony, the sort of eye roll uh, thing. Um, and this, of course, I, if Wikipedia is to be, be believed, is something that people have been trying to come up with punctuation marks for like centuries. Um, this is one from the end of the 19th century on the left here um, that people have proposed in, I guess, a French person proposed for marking irony. Um, and of course, in online communication, you also have variations in which you, not necessarily emoji, that have been used to perhaps commute, uh, communicate irony. So what a productive meeting slash sarcasm. Or what a productive meeting, wink. Then uh, this tilde, this sort of tittle, tilde on either side, I actually don't know this, but I, I, this has been reported in um, the McCulloch, work by McCulloch, um, that this is also something that apparently has been used as a sarcasm marker. Um, so again, this is something that's been studied in, in sign language. Uh, for Italian sign language, this is Lara Montevin. And she basically asks, how, what facial expressions do you use when you're being ironic in sign language? And there are a couple of markers that seem to be consistent comparing ironic speech to non-ironic speech. So a lot of these are prosodic cues, so saying it a little bit more exaggerated, uh, longer, per, multiple head nods at the same time raised eyebrows, which is generally used for focus as well. And so one thing that's notable about all these is that it's not necessarily specific to irony, right? You see these in other cases as well. But another thing that she describes are these facts that you have contradictory facial expressions. So if you're being serious, you say, oh, that was fun. And you kind of have your mouths going up. But if you say, oh, that was fun. And you have got your the mouth corners going down, like this one here then you're more likely to be sarcastic. If you say, oh, that is worthless, and you've got your mouth going down, it means it's actually worthless, but you say, oh, that's uh, that's worth, I, you have to come up with a context in which this would be, um, make sense, but if you've got a smile, then you're kind of being sarcastic, like what a, what a, what a crappy restaurant. <laughs> um, and so I was, I wanted to suggest that in fact, you know, I, I think these things, people have been spent, centuries trying to have something catch on for marking irony or sarcasm. And I think probably the best way to mark it is going to be something very similar to these contradictory cues. It's much more clear to me than any of the, at least especially the tilde one, um, that if you say, what a productive meaning, angry face, then this was not, a, you're being sarcastic. And if you say, another dull day in New York, and you've got stars in your eyes that you're being, once again, um, sarcastic. It's impossible to have a dull day in New York. There's celebrities and things to see, Central Park, et cetera. Um, and so, uh, once again, I think it's another case where you kind of see cues appearing um, in some form because, again, but here it's sort of cueing you into whether you should, one cue is compatible with the truth, like the this proposition, and the other essentially is compatible with the the negation of the proposition, but because this we, is something that we do with language, we flout maxims, um, this can be. Another sort of thing that I think is a question that relates back to this question of primitives is maybe irony is not, despite the desire of people to have this be marked in a sort of constant way, is perhaps not a good primitive. And more, more maybe really what irony is, is this juxtaposition of something which is not uh, being literally um, interpreted. So I think I think I, I've got a little bit more here, but but I think for time I'm going to stop because you know I can send this to you offline as well. So. Uh, so thank you, Jeremy, for this these really thoughtful comments. This was really exciting to hear and listen to. And uh, so I have three to four minutes, so I'm gonna. Uh, see, I, I took notes. I'm going to see what I can focus on. Thank you for um, the pointers to the literature. Um, definitely sign language is one of uh, the areas, like sign language research is one of the areas where it would be really interesting and exciting to see how phenomena that we see there relate to what face emojis and other emojis do. Like one thing that emojis can do is focus marking, for instance, since you mentioned that, like one thing that people do a lot is like, uh, two fingers to sort of mark that the thing between them is prominent. 
but you can also have a single repetition of two face emojis to mark that what is between them is prominent. So I think this is something that they can absolutely do. When it comes to innateness, which is a topic that you mentioned, I think that certainly plays into it. Um, in when emojis were introduced, I think especially for for people like myself who didn't grow up with emojis, the iconic nature of emojis is probably very dominant. Like we look at them and we see them as facial expressions. Once you talk to people who were born after 1996, like uh, emoji natives uh, or uh, digital natives, whatever you want to call it, um, they have much more lexicalized meanings. And I'm sometimes struck by how some of the emoji meanings are have moved away from a, an iconic interpretation. Like a, a, the regular happy face, like a, not, not the, the one that is called the psychopath emoji, but the one that's actually a genuinely happy face with like happy eyes. People tell me it's ironic because it's, you can't use it seriously anymore because you know people started using it to convey genuine happiness and then it gets overused and suddenly people only use it ironically. Uh, one thing that's interesting about experiments is that age doesn't actually, seem to matter like people people who do experiments like acceptability ratings seem to perform exactly the same way across all age groups so there is a, a bit of a hope that it all sort of comes together somewhere but there's definitely this continuum between the iconic meaning like they look like facial expressions and the lexicalized meaning and on the iconic side i mean innateness definitely plays into it like those those artifacts that emojis are are based on our facial expressions and some of what's going on there might be very well innate i think this is a really super interesting thing to look at i'd have a lot of things to say about discourse particles and those things um but uh i guess one thing that i wanted to comment on before my four minutes up is um uh I really enjoyed seeing the videos, especially the one that you made specifically for today. And one thing that immediately came to me is McGurk effect. I mean, there, there was this recent work where people, uh, um, I, I should remember their exact names, but I'm, I'm not gonna attempt. It's like a group of, uh, I think three authors who worked on the McGurk effect with uh, beat gestures. So people clearly integrate things like gestures and facial expressions with speech. And uh, when you had the, the eyebrow raise, together with uh, with the sentence that you pronounced. For me, the only reading I got is very strong that you're surprised that it is kind of like John is coming to the party. It's like surprising. Um, so I think we we most of those examples, we will make sense of them. I think people will very rarely go like, oh, this is like a weird combination of a facial expression of speech. We're just trying to sort of accommodate for it. And I think that is a really interesting thing to look at. So lots of things to think about, uh, lots, of, uh, lots of interesting questions there. So thank you so much once again.